First off, I want to thank everybody in the comments of my last video wishing me well and for a speedy recovery. Of course, that goes out to all of you, and I do want to apologize if the audio is just a little off in this video. I'm still recovering physically from the brain aneurysm I suffered from after watching Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon last week, and the mental state is just a little off. Doc says I'm doing good so far, on track and on schedule, but he never fails to mention that some never really make it back. That being said, with all the spare time I've been given in between watching 90s novellas, getting loopy in front of my parents, and enjoying the open breeze of the hospital gown, I've been able to spend a lot of time on Letterbox, organizing, creating new lists, and perusing the canvas that us the audience will be working with for 2024. And let me tell you, we're definitely entering Hollywood's filler arc. Not a bad meta, but a forgettable one for sure. With all of the highest of highs and lowest of lows that came with 2023, from the biggest cultural event post-endgame with Barbenheimer to pretty much anything that came out from Disney, it's hard to know what is the most successful formula when it comes to that audience and box office relationship. Besides the obvious, is it better to come home with a report card of A's and F's, averaging to a C, showcasing the ability to thrive in some studies while being brain dead in another, or have a report card full of C's altogether, never thriving, never striving, but never failing. I guess when thinking about it out loud, there's an easy answer to that, hence why I came to the conclusion that 2024 is Hollywood's filler arc. It is what it is. Filler can be fun depending on the way that it's handled, and with this year's January being even more of a graveyard than last, with no Megan to even get some butts in seats for a single time, unless the beekeeper is your thing, I figured why not take the time to talk about what's on the menu and our future. Because while it doesn't seem like we have any real shitters, it doesn't seem like we have any real winners either. Of course, for the majority of these movies, I know just as much as you guys, so these aren't reviews or even deep intellectual thoughts, just simple reasons of why I'm more than likely going to go watch whatever movie I'm talking about. I do want to say that these aren't in any particular order, but come on now, my OCD ass could never... So here are some honorable mentions, because let me tell you, we have way too many movies to actually talk about, so sorry. Anyway. What better movie to prove my point of 2024 being Hollywood's filler arc than the MCU felt Godzilla and Kong MonsterVerse? Not a shitter and not a winner, but you'll be sure to find me in the theaters for some brain dead fun. While I reiterated in my Godzilla Minus One review that I do believe that that was the best adaptation of Godzilla put to screen, I'm not above watching Lizard and Monkey team up to fight Bigger Monkey. It seems like Warner Brothers is full sending on the turn your brain off approach when it comes to this franchise. And while that can either work out in the best way possible like with the Fast and Furious franchise, or blow up in your face like the Transformers Bayverse, I'm always here to contribute to the cause. Hmm. I would say that I would be more excited if John Krasinski was still the leading man of this franchise, which sounds pretty bad because I'm prejudging somebody else's vision, but the two Quiet Place movies were truly a breath of fresh air when it came to the horror genre. Suspenseful, intense, and thrilling, all while incorporating a common disability into a narrative that actually fits the story. The bathtub scene is iconic and pretty much says anything I need to say to why this movie ended up on this list. Poe, Tai Lung, Shen, come on now. It's almost been a decade since we've seen our goat or panda. Okay, so kind of for the same reason A Quiet Place Day 1 is ranked so low on this list, with Matt Reeves no longer returning to the franchise, and a major time skip already announced for a beginning of what I'm sure Disney would like to make into a second sequel, it just leaves the mind skeptical for a change in vision of what was already a successful run. And trust me, I don't want to be cynical, but we have seen this before with Disney in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Caribbean? That trilogy is god tier and stands the test of time as one of the most underrated and underappreciated trilogies to this very day. And well, 
I don't have to remind you guys of what happened when Disney got a little too greedy with their food. Shout out to America, bro. We are truly brain dead. In a movie that might symbolize and idealize the most capitalistic and American production ever put to screen, in a time where it seems like America is at its most divided, let alone releasing in a year of what is quite possibly the most important and impactful election this nation has ever seen, why not just showcase what that would look like? God, it is actually hilarious and whatever, I'm here for it. As well as Jesse Plemons. Man, what is that guy not in and why is he so damn good for no reason? Whatever. You got my vote, Jesse Plemons. Come on, yo. Anna de Armas based in the John Wick universe? I will forever argue the point that the John Wick franchise should stay dead, and the characters should definitely stay dead. But that doesn't mean the universe should, and please, don't make me repeat myself. Okay, so I am not the biggest fan of musicals, which is what it's looking like this movie is definitely shaping up to be. And with Lady Gaga casted in the role of Harley Quinn, it's kind of hard to go against those rumors even though the idea hasn't been confirmed. And that's not to say that I don't appreciate music or Lady Gaga's voice. I'm no idiot. Let's just say it's an interesting vision to take when making a sequel to one of the best character-driven movies in the past decade, and one of the most iconic villains to ever grace the entertainment landscape. But hey, I won't knock it till I try it. And the box office and masterpiece that was the first Joker has earned my benefit of the doubt. The big B though, is definitely going to be some hard shoes to fill, especially in this climate. So I know I'm in the minority here. I don't know if it's just that kid bias in me coming out because I was watching the original Aliens film growing up or just how badass the alien design is and how cool in theory the creature can be on the big screen. But I don't believe that the Alien franchise is dead. As one of the rare people that actually enjoyed Prometheus, Alien Covenant, and the world building that they were introducing through those stories, I can understand taking a step back from those convoluted storylines and wanting to get back to the roots of the franchise. And with the new Alien movie set to take place in between the original Alien and Aliens, those are kind of the deepest roots that you're going to get when it comes to this franchise. And with Fede Alvarez helming the project, director of both Don't Breathe and Evil Dead 2013, I think it's fair to say that the fans of the Alien franchise are in very good hands. As someone who has never seen a Mad Max film, either old or new, y'all know me. I will never be passing up on my girl Anya Taylor-Joy, a true masterclass at her craft, and I have no doubt that this will just be another film to add to her incredible resume. Man, she is just so good. And with Chris Hemsworth still leaving a bad taste in people's mouths after the suppressed memory that was Thor Love and Thunder rearing its ugly head because, let's be real, no one watched Extraction 2. I'm sure he's going to be ready to give a performance in order to reshape his image with fans and career within Hollywood. With that being said, before I get cooked in these comments, do I have to watch any of the Mad Max movies to understand what's going on here? Are those movies even good? Oh god, never mind. I'm already getting cooked. I can feel it already. Come on, yo. It's the go. With Hugh Jackman returning to play his iconic character of Wolverine, as well as donning the original suit, it pretty much solidified that this is more than likely going to be a billion dollar movie for Marvel, rather you like it or not. Deadpool and Ryan Reynolds are one of those few characters to actor relationships now in Hollywood where you genuinely feel like the actor cares and wants to be the character that they're portraying and not just looking for an easy paycheck because we've fallen on hard times. And I imagine that that passion is what convinced Hugh Jackman to come back and test what Ryan Reynolds was cooking. Without the constraints of the MCU holding the film back, it sounds like we're just going to be able to watch the same old Deadpool that we have come to know, love, and give our money to.
Is it just me or is Willem Dafoe just one of the best all time? Shout out to my boy for getting the Walk of Fame star, an absolute masterclass. He just simply demands your presence in every role he takes on. And in his role as Professor Albin Eberhard von Franz? Definitely slowed that down and still messed that up. AKA the Vampire Hunter is no exception. Trying to tackle one of the most iconic movies to date is no easy feat. A movie that shaped a new niche into a genre and paved the path for vampires on the big screen. Even if that path did just end up becoming Twilight in True Blood. Whatever, it's Willem Dafoe, man. I don't know what to tell you. Okay, so to be honest, I considered not even throwing Dune Part 2 on the list in its entirety, not even on the honorable mentions because this movie was not supposed to release this year. And while in hindsight we won't know if delaying the movie during the strikes was a good move or not, I think that this film could solidify Timothy Chalamet as box office. And no, I am not talking about the Chris Pratt type of box office where any old Joe Schmo can just take on those roles that he's taking on and do the same work for less pay, but the box office will still just be the same. No, no sir. I'm talking about the type of box office that puts butts in seats because they know a performance is about to take place. Wonka already kind of put the nail in the coffin for me, earning almost $500 million on a $125 million budget, but a great box office for Dune Part 2 would nail that point home for me. With stunning visual effects and being able to witness the second half of what some could argue was a dragged out first half of a story being played out, once I decided to throw it on the list, to be honest, there really wasn't any debate. But there we go, those are my most anticipated movies for Hollywood's 2024 filler art. I don't know how many that ended up being on this list, but like I said at the beginning, not a lot of shitters, but not a lot of winners. And while I don't want to say that the majority of these films are going to be mid, it just seems like it's going to be forgettable, if that makes sense. It happens. Of course, as always, I want to thank you guys for watching the video. And if you enjoyed, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. I should say follow me on Twitter. I did start a whole new account for this channel, so I'm going to start promoting that a little bit more. Again, I want to thank you guys for watching the video. Make sure to like and subscribe. If you did enjoy this video, why not click on more while you're at it? Otherwise, that's all the words I got for you today. Bye.